Welcome, welcome, one and all, to the penultimate episode of Movie Club Season 1. That's right, we're almost at the end, and I wanted to do something special uh, to kind of wrap up this whole, whole season. And in a way, I borrowed from a book that has no author by trying to open at the close. What we're about to go through are all the movies that we explored prior to this becoming a video series with Night of the Living Dead. Namely, we did Knives Out, Hook, a double feature of Oh Hello on Broadway, and <laughs> David Lynch's new weird Netflix short film, What Did Jack Do? And then, of course, the fantastic The World's End. And the best way I knew how to do this concisely and without this episode taking well over three hours to film for a two hour final cut, I decided to give myself a time limit. I will have five minutes to discuss each and every film and why I think it's important and why we screened it to begin with. Talking a little bit about some of the trivia that I love about it and as well as, you know, discussing the director's other works before moving on to, you know, what I think is the most important stuff. And then we'll wrap everything up with a nice little bow and I'll send you off into the night because next week we will cover the final film on Movie Club Season 1, which is actually the very first film we cover here. On April 8th, 2020, my friends and I sat down and we did a test screening to see if this would work. We used a Spanish language horror film known as Rec to, you know, test this technology, see if we could actually pull it off. And over a year later, I'm happy to say that it worked. And we've been doing nearly an episode every week. Of course, I've taken a couple weeks off here and there for work and other stuff. And then, you know, done crazy things by trying to put in as many episodes as I possibly can. We're going to put five minutes on the clock for each film and I'll discuss it in turn. Hopefully that makes sense. If it doesn't, I'll probably explain it better in the, the description. So just check that out. There's also sources downstairs. So if you want to check those out uh, and learn more about the movies, I would highly, highly recommend that. As you can see, I've got five minutes on the clock. This is the best way I know how to do this. And uh, at the end of the five minutes, I'll stop talking and we'll move on to the next movie. Sound good? Cool. I'm not really asking you. It's a rhetorical question. I'm the only one in this room. Don't know why I keep asking these questions, but it doesn't matter. So without further ado, let's discuss our first film tonight, Knives Out. Knives Out is a fantastic 2019 film from writer-director Ryan Johnson, who as the marketing material for this film might suggest, directed Star Wars The Last Jedi. I'm kind of certain that he did that just to rub the nerds' noses in it, just because there was such a, a huge backlash to his Star Wars movie. Obviously, I won't discuss that here because this is not the episode to do that and would take way more than the four and a half minutes we have left. So, what I will talk about is Ryan Johnson's other work because Johnson is no stranger to the detective genre or the, the investigative nature of filmmaking. In fact, one of his first features, Brick, starring Joseph Gordon-Levitt, does this immensely well, although with a very different vibe. That film is, is much more serious in nature and the subject matter in that film is a lot darker, as well as it's the dialogue is, is like it's an old-fashioned noir film, but it's set in a high school. So there's a bunch of different vibes going on, but it's an absolutely brilliant script and a fantastic movie that we will eventually cover here on Movie Club because it's one of my favorites from this director and I think continues to prove his talent. But not only is this director really good at making serious films like Brick or Looper, he's also uh, pretty damn good in my opinion at making something incredibly funny whilst also tightly plotted. And nothing I think exemplifies that better than his story about Harlan Thrombey and the rest of the Thrombey family in Knives Out. This is a film that you, at least in the movie theaters, I think always thought you knew where it was going before it took a detour and became a completely different film before it became a completely different film again. It constantly subverts your expectations in the best way possible and keeps you guessing about who the killer is right up until the end, even when you think you know for certain. There are, are elements of, of Agatha Christie all over this, and it's clear that not only is Johnson an immaculate director who puts together quite a stacked cast and as of right now, is currently casting literally every famous actor ever that hasn't already been in Knives Out in his Knives Out 2 film. Honestly, I can't wait because this was one of my favorite films of 2019. And I think 
only upon rewatches and reading over the screenplay do I seem find new things that I absolutely love about this. All the jokes that I missed the first time, all the little tidbits, all the little filmmaking tricks that he does to fake uh, a full set <laughs> when, you know, to hide uh, a full cast and crew when most of his actors are wearing glasses. It's absolutely fascinating the amount of work that went into this and I can't believe all the old school techniques and brilliant ensemble acting that he is able to elicit out of his fantastic cast here. Uh, most notably from Christopher Plummer who has sadly passed away now. This I think will remain one of my favorite performances of Plummer's but not only do we have a great performance from them, we have fantastic and very different from the norm performances from both Michael Shannon, Chris Evans, Ricky Lindholm, uh, Tony Collette, and pretty much every other famous actor out there at the time. And I absolutely cannot not mention the fantastic actor who plays Marta Cabrera here, our main character, Anna de Armas. She's absolutely fascinating in every movie I've seen her in to date. Uh, one of my favorite portrayals of hers is from Blade Runner 2049. If you haven't checked that out, I highly recommend it. De Armas is able to play uh, a, a seemingly unassuming nurse that clearly cares about Harlan Thrombey up until his death and then is, is faced down with a lot of new obstacles in the midst of his death. She is a incredible person to follow and because of her uh, her kindness to the family, there's a, a genuine thread of empathy throughout this crime drama that otherwise wouldn't be there. And I think it's all due to the fantastic acting of both the Armas and the rest of the ensemble as well as the incredible script and directing of, of Ryan Johnson that makes Knives Out such a fantastic movie that you will return to time and time again. Well, that wraps up our discussion on Knives Out. Up next is the fantastic film, or at least very interesting film to discuss, Hook, from director Steven Spielberg. Hook is such an interesting film to discuss, and I mostly wanted to tackle it because pretty much everyone in the club at the time had not seen Hook in multiple years. It was one of those films that I think really was compelling because of the fantastic cast at its core of Robin Williams and Dustin Hoffman. It, it, it really made no sense why this film was such a dud when it came to Spielberg. I do think its length is a bit prohibitive because it's technically a kids movie, but it like over nearly two and a half hours, it it, it doesn't really feel like it, it runs like a kids movie, but it's maybe a kids movie for adults. I don't know. There's a lot of adult humor here, which is pretty typical of Spielberg from this era, but I, I, I do think there's a lot to love here, even if it doesn't always land perfectly. I, I do think some of the Spielberg schmaltz here washes over some of the, the more interesting elements of this, some of the darker elements of this, but overall I think you get two fantastic performances in the leads from uh, Dustin Hoffman playing one of the most iconic versions of Captain Hook ever, as well as... Robin Williams, playing an always endearing character to me, a uh, Peter Pan who has grown up and has had a family. But once his family is kidnapped by ca uh, Captain Hook, he has to return to Neverland and remember how to fly. There's actually some really beautiful heartwarming elements here, and I, I, won't, I will admit here, I did cry during this movie. So it, there is stuff that truly does work here. It just makes me wish that maybe if we tightened up the pacing and maybe remove some of the more weird elements to this film, that in actuality we would have something much better. A version of Hook that wouldn't just be forgotten to time, but would actually still be beloved. And that's sad because I do think there's a lot to love here about Hook. The fantastic cinematography here uh, is just, I, I cannot possibly communicate how impressed I was with some of the, the shot choices and how they, they chose to frame an entire scene through a window and then pull out to reveal a full uh, cityscape. Absolutely amazing some of the things they go to and the production design here, especially when we get to Neverland, is top notch. This is a fantastic adventure film that I think a lot of parents might end up showing their kids one day because they were me, they were coming of age when you know it was out on VHS and was accessible through things like Blockbuster. This is a film that I remembered fondly 
but didn't know quite why I never returned to it. And while I don't think it always nails its tone or its style, I do think that it is worth studying for being one of Spielberg's misfires. And I think most interesting to me when I was digging into some of the fun facts about this is that the story here is written, or at least the initial draft of this story was written by Jim Hart and Nick Castle. If you're a horror fan, Nick Castle might ring true to you or, or ring a bell for you because Nick Castle was the original portrayer of The Shape in John Carpenter's iconic and genre-defining film, Halloween. So there's all these weird elements that come in to make this interesting story. And you have like incredible performances from once again, I think another ensemble cast. Maggie Smith is here, Dustin Hoffman's here, Robin Williams is here. And, and I do think some a lot of the special effects really, really work and have aged extremely well. I just, there's something about it that doesn't quite land in the way that I think everything else should. So I guess I, I don't want to come down on this film because I really had a good time with this. It actually elicited emotions from me. So it succeeded, it succeeded in a lot of things it was trying to do. I just don't think it always nails the tone. But I do think Hook, directed by Steven Spielberg, is definitely worth checking out, especially if you're like me and want to return to a part of your childhood and remember how to fly. And up next, we have a very, very weird double feature of David Lynch's short film for Netflix, What Did Jack Do?, as well as the fantastic uh, Broadway show from <laughs> Nick Kroll and John Mulaney, Oh Hello on Broadway. So this particular weird screening came from uh, us panicking. This is the first time that our, our projectionist, Kent Gunn, one of the co-creators of Movie Club, couldn't be there. So Gavin and I, the other two creators of the show, uh, tried to do our own screening. It turns out that Discord hates Mac and refuses to uh, create very basic features for it, despite the technology clearly being there because you can use Zoom or Skype or literally any other program to do exactly what you know we wanted to do. But at the time, we couldn't get it to work and Zoom had not added the, the extra long time link, so we, we couldn't watch an entire film. And it was very complicated, but we were intending to watch Paddington that night. And it turned out for us that Paddington was a cursed movie that we couldn't screen. Our screening failed, we had to go to Netflix party, and we watched two weird things on Netflix to, you know, make up for our failed screening. So needless to say, we didn't want to try and do Paddington anymore, but we had to come up with something because we had a couple hours to fill for these people. So what we did do is a double feature of director David Lynch's short film for Netflix, What Did Jack Do?, and the tape play from Nick Kroll and John Mulaney, Oh Hello on Broadway. So I'll take these two things in turn and discuss them real quick. I had been a pretty big fan of David Lynch for a while. I'd seen Twin Peaks and absolutely loved it. I think it's one of the most fascinating shows that's ever aired on uh, national television. I don't, I still don't know how you managed to pull that off, but whatever. Him and Mark Frost created something fantastic with that. Uh, Blue Velvet is also one of my uh, favorite movies. It's just absolutely fascinating. So needless to say, when I sat down to watch David Lynch's short film about a detective played by him investigating a murder that may have been perpetrated by a monkey in a train station, I wasn't weirded out. It was seen par for the course for me, and I really liked it. There's a weird musical number, it's shot in black and white, it's it's very Nor-esque, and it's clear that either you'll get a kick out of it because David Lynch is taking the material so seriously, or because it's just such a fascinating and weird movie with so many different layers that I don't even remotely have time to talk about. Our second thing was Oh Hello on Broadway, a taped version for Netflix of John Mulaney's and Nick Kroll's stage show, which they did for a couple years on Broadway. It's such a fascinating teardown of, of Broadway whilst also rebuilding it in their own image. And it is so delightfully irreverent and hilarious that it, it you can't help but have a good time. It is so funny to watch these two geriatric characters and all their weird musings on everything from love to life to career. And it's just such a fascinating show to watch from top to bottom. There's so many different weird in-jokes for theater nerds, as well as people who just really like Nick Kroll and John Mulaney. It's absolutely must watch Broadway, I guess. 
It is so deeply funny and such a fun time that I don't even remotely have uh, time to discuss all of the things I love about it, including their weird game show or talk show towards the end of the sh every, every night where they actually bring a real life celebrity on stage and interview them in character. Too much tuna. It's absolutely fascinating. I don't have time to get into all of it. Uh, I would highly recommend that you go check out both of these in a double feature. You're gonna have a fun night regardless. And I, I, I can't uh, imagine that we could have come up with such a, a weird screening evening on purpose. And I don't think we ever will come up with something quite this devilishly interesting ever again. And it makes me sad. Sometimes the alchemic brew of spontaneity and chance produces something quite interesting. And I think that night when Paddington failed, we pick something incredibly interesting that we'll never be able to replicate on Movie Club. And that leaves us with one more movie to discuss tonight before we discuss next week, our final movie, which was also the very first movie we covered on Movie Club. It has been a fascinating season so far. And with only one episode left, I, it feels a bit bittersweet. I'll save all those sentiments for next week as we cover tonight, the second film we ever covered on Movie Club. The second week of Movie Club was the first time we ever had our first official guest on. We brought in a friend from high school and asked if she wanted to check it out. And sure enough, she has been one of our most consistent attendees uh, and uh, biggest champions of the show. And especially was encouraging when we moved to the video format. We thought, what, what thing could we pick that would be irreverent and funny, uh, but also would feel apt for the time? So I picked The World's End. I absolutely love Edgar Wright and Simon Pegg and Nick Frost. And so what better way to, to portray the end of the world than, you know, The World's End, the third flavor in the Three Flavors Cornetto trilogy, which is an unofficial trilogy uh, that ties together uh, multiple character actors across three films where they play different people in different genres. It's wild. The first film in this, unofficial franchise is uh, Shaun of the Dead, which is still one of my favorite British comedies of all time. And it has so much heart and it's absolutely delightful. And it's it's a, adapting one of my favorite subgenres in horror. And it does it so lovingly and so well and so funnily that I'm so glad they got to make more films. Of course, uh, Hot Fuzz comes next, which is a cop drama action film. Most recently was The World's End, a film that Although I didn't get to see it in theaters because at the time I didn't really recognize any any of it, any of those people. It, it was also not a time when I was, I was going to see a lot of movies because I was still in high school. It, my favorite of the three flavors Cornetto trilogy. And I know that's wild to say because Shaun of the Dead and Hot Fuzz are so good and The World's End is often critically regarded as probably the weakest of the series, even though it still is very good. I just think there's so much more going on here than in any of the previous films that it's, it's worth digging into because this is a film about Gary and his friends from high school going back to their hometown to try and complete the Golden Mile, which is a famous trail of, of beer in their hometown where they have a pint at each one of these bars all the way up until the bar that also shares the movie's title, The World's End. Unlike the rest of his friends, Gary has not really progressed mentally or uh, maturity wise since that date, since he left town all those years ago. And returning here, he feels like he's the prodigal son and he feels like he has something to prove. The problem is at this point, Gary has become an alcoholic and is using this as a coping mechanism and is trying to return to the last time that anything in his life ever made sense. So the sense of tragedy that's at the heart of this, underneath all the jokes and all the brilliant one-liners and all the fantastic directing and stylistic choices from director Edgar Wright, you can't help but feel that there's something deeper going on in this film, something that is so worth exploring, that each comedic line can also be read as a tragedy. Two-edged sword nature of this film makes it so much more rewarding to continue watching it, to, to return to it. And it makes you want to root for this character and his friends to succeed, to actually make it out of this situation alive. Because the one thing I haven't mentioned yet, which is wild, 
is that their town has been overtaken by robots that have, are replacing everyone in town, and so they're trying to finish the Golden Mile without raising suspicion. So there's a lot going on in this movie. It's a sci-fi masterpiece. It's so funny, but it's also got so much heart and so much empathy. And there's so much going on that you can't help but celebrate it. It's absolutely delightful, and it's the perfect wrap-up to the Three Flavors Cornetto trilogy, and it's why it's my favorite of those films. And I absolutely love it, and I think you should check it out. Well, that just about wraps up our time today on Movie Club as we covered pretty much all of the films we covered prior to this becoming a video series with Night of the Living Dead. So uh, thank you for joining us on our penultimate episode of Movie Club Season 1. I hope you enjoyed this rapid fire run through all of these fantastic movies that I just didn't have time to cover in depth right now. But I hope this was satisfying for you. And I hope you got a new laundry list of movies to check out if you hadn't heard of these, or if you have heard of these, you might want to return to them in light of some of the things I've told you tonight. It's, it's been fun kind of curating things for people and, and trying to taste make from different people. It's been one of my favorite things this past year and it's honestly kept me sane. So I hope that you found something that you've loved across this season, but we do have one more movie to check out next week. And man, is it a doozy. There's so much depth to it, so much complexity to it, and I, it's the perfect way to send us out because it is the very first movie we ever covered on Movie Club. So regardless of where you are right now, I hope that at least this has been some semblance of comfort or it's taken away a little bit of pressure. Like every Friday night, you can sit down and you can trust that someone else will pick a movie for you. I hope you've checked out a lot of these movies and not just watched these videos because you're like me. I appreciate it if it's the, the latter, but also I hope you maybe experimented, checked out some new things. And I hope this has been fruitful for you. So regardless, this is the perfect time for me to wrap this up. Thank you so much for joining us on Movie Club this season. We've got one more episode next week. I'll see you all then. But for now, I've been your host and curator around these parts, Patrick Smith. And this has been Movie Club. I'll see you all at the movies. <laughs>